So today I'd like to uh, talk to you about um, uh, the data structure we, we use very often uh, called a, a map um, and how it doesn't, it's not the best fit for every single uh, situation we use it in uh, because it does not enforce some invariants that we'd like uh, to have enforced. So the, the general theme of this uh, presentation is about how to use Scala's advanced type system to your benefit. And um, we may be going slightly beyond what you can do very comfortably in Scala, either because you haven't learned that part of Scala yet, or because Scala has some warts in that area, because we'll be touching dependent types and things like that. But I think it's very interesting to see what we can do with Scala. Um, so we won't be looking at the library just from the point of view of a user, but we'll also get into it a little bit to see how it's built, uh, how the, the magic is, is kind of accomplished. Um, although, keep in mind that as a user, you don't have to understand really how it's built. Uh, I just thought it might interest you as Scala developers to figure it, to, to see how it uh, has been put together. So coming back to what is the problem we're trying to solve? This is the map trait in Scala, slightly simplified. I've put the only method we'll be interested in here. Uh, actually, the main method we're interested in is the get method that allows us to pass a key of type k here and get back here an option of a value of type v. So this option is the problem. Um, because you put something in a map, you expect to get the value back when you pass the same key again. But now you've got to check, is it, is it there? Um, you have a few options um, to work around this annoyance. One option is to use option.get. That's not a total function. It's going to throw an exception if the option is none. So it's kind of a slippery uh, situation. You have to convince yourself that that option will never be none before you call .get. Because you probably don't want to catch exceptions anyway. Um, so that may be the best choice when you're sure that your option uh, will not be none. So you're sure that the, op the, uh, the value you're lo looking for is really present in the map. Another approach you can take when you're not so sure is to use get or else and then pass in a default value. Sometimes there's no default value that really makes sense and you'll use fold instead and have different code branches depending on whether the element was found or it wasn't. Knowing what to do here is difficult because you're talking about a corner case. You're not even sure if it happens for real in your program. Um, so you may not have any requirements for that situation. So you, it, it's almost dead code, um, but at the same time, you, you want to make it look, you want results that kind of make sense. So you might have to go back and get new requirements. What do we do when this happens? Or it might force you to better understand what your program does and in which situations you might not get an element back when you uh, look up in that map. So you always have to think, is, this, is it impossible for references in, in my map to be uh, invalid? If it's possible, you need to handle it appropriately. And if it's not, then you, can, you get to use .get or uh, some similar um, way of kind of sweeping the problems under, under the rug. But if you make the wrong call, if you use uh, .get in appropriate in inappropriate situations, then you get bugs. And if you invest a lot in writing dead code, of course, you're wasting time. So that's not, that's not great. So what the total map tries to do is give you a, a proof through the type system that it's impossible for um, 
the elements you want to be, uh, to be missing from your, from your map. And this property is called referential integrity, and it's been in place in many database systems, especially relational database systems, for a long time. Uh, it takes the name of uh, foreign keys. Here we have a very simple database with two tables, um, shipments that refer to parts. Um, there is a foreign key in place between the part ID uh, column of the shipment table and the ID column of the part table. This is really a subset relation. We're saying that any of the values that appear in the first column here, the part ID column, must also be present in the ID column of the part table. That means whenever you look up a value in the first, you will necessarily be able to find it in the second one. Now, this is enforced at runtime through throwing, throwing exceptions whenever you insert in the first table and violate the property, or whenever you remove from the second table and, again, violate the property. So it is protecting you in some sense. It is bringing some errors earlier on to the process, possibly preventing corruption in your, data, in your database, uh, but you may very easily forget to handle those potential exceptions when you insert or remove. This same schema that we saw in a database, we can reproduce in memory using Scala types. Um, here we only care about indexing into the, the second table, so we'll create a a map for the parts table, uh, the key type will pick int. Um, that's something you see very often in production software, I guess. Uh, perhaps long, but uh, these things happen. And we'd have then uh, shipments that represents, it's a list of tuples to represent the, the rows of the first column, uh, the first table. And here we have a quantity and a part ID. Now we're, we're using int as part IDs, so we have some confusion, that, um, confusion potential here with the two ints. But this is a, a typical scenario. That's how you encode, I guess, the, uh, uh, the two tables in Scala types. You can do a little bit better by creating a case class called part ID that kind of wraps your int and this at least avoids confusion between your quantity and uh, your part IDs. And it becomes more readable this way. However, in, in the previous, um, previous encoding and in this encoding, um, you don't have any referential integrity guarantee. There's no constraint present at compile time um, that would guarantee that uh, the part IDs that you reference in shipments are actually present in the map. So how can we solve this? Let's start with the total map. Uh, let's start with the map trait and see how the total map differs. So the first difference is that the K type parameter is gone. Um, we will be changing uh, types frequently. So we will want to have that type instead be a type member in the total map. So each total map will be able to decide what is the appropriate um, identifier type uh, for itself. And then the get method will not return an option, it will return a value all the time. So that's what we want. And because of that, uh, we will be able to use that total map as a function. We already can use maps as a function. They have uh, an apply method, but it's a partial function. Um, so it's something that's a little bit dangerous. Here, we can very safely uh, call this getter function uh, apply, 
and our total map would be a total function. And this is the, the ultimate benefit. It allows us to encode our two tables now this way. When we define the, the parts data structure, um, we use the total map instead of map. We don't have to invent some kind of key type. The total map takes care of it. And in the shipments data structure, we get to refer to the ID type that is in the parts data structure. So this is path dependent types. And it's working out really well here because it documents clearly what's going on, um, that there is this uh, kind of foreign key relationship between shipments uh, and parts. Um, so we get safer lookups. We also get uh, safer updates. <clears throat> this function here, update, is a bit hard to implement uh, safely with ordinary maps. Uh, again, because you don't have a guarantee that the key you're passing in actually corresponds to an element that's present. Here, since we know that, uh, we can have an update function. You just pass an identifier to it and a function you want to run on um, the element that's present just to change it. So it has impact elsewhere in the, in the class. Now, how does the insert and remove function, um, how do they look? So the main thing to realize is as we insert elements in a total map, the previous type we were using for identifier is no longer applicable. It, it doesn't uh, contain enough elements as we insert. So we need to have new types that admit more values as we insert elements into a map. And when we remove the situation is reversed, we need to go back to types that have fewer values. So here's the signature for insert. I've, um, it's not exactly the way it appears in the library. I've used a structural type here just to make it easier on the presentation. Uh, it essentially returns, uh, it returns two things. Um, the new total map that results from the insertion and also the new ID that was allocated. There's a dependency between the two. So I can't just return a tuple. A tuple two would not do because um, if you see the new ID um, is referencing the other member. So here total ID is referencing this other field. So that's a dependent tuple. Scala allows us to express that pretty easily here. And what's special about the new total map that's returned is we are using a refinement type here to talk about its ID type. So we know something about the ID type of the new total map is that it will be a super type of the previous one. And this guarantee allows us to reuse all the IDs we have allocated for the previous total map to also use them in the future with this uh, return total map. So uh, we don't have to invalidate all the previous IDs. We just have one more ID to work with. When we remove the situation is reversed and we have a sub um, a new identifier type in the resulting total map that is a subtype of the previous one. So this uh, total this is a bit hard to read, but basically it's just a way to reference the ID type stored in, in the outer context here. We're inside uh, the total class. We can do this other ways by giving some other name. It's just we've got two uh, identifiers uh, with the same name, so we need some way to disambiguate. Now, on removal, uh, one of the identifier is now invalid, so we can't quite um, reuse 
the identifiers we had before without touching them because they have the wrong type. They have a type that's uh, dependent on the old total map. If we want to move to the new total map, then we need some way of doing that. And this is what the filter function provides. It takes a key or an identifier of the old total map and gives you an option of an identifier of the new total map. So this is the cumbersome part of um, this whole thing. We want guarantees. We have to uh, prove that uh, we uh, that the situations we want to hold actually hold. Um, that we are never uh, storing invalid references. So I, with removal comes a cost. We have to go through all the references we had and make sure they're still valid. And if they're not, then we're going to get none here. And we'll need to handle that. Possibly we'll remove the reference, move it to somewhere else, or just remove it altogether. So this was insertion and removal. Um, now I'd like to discuss a slight uh, complication that I didn't illustrate before. Um, if we go back to uh, shipments and parts, uh, one thing you typically want to do, uh, which I kind of skipped over uh, in the first presentation of this, was to, um, so what you want to do is create a shipment case class. Uh, I used a tuple before because it was really uh, convenient. But let's say you want to create a case class for this. Now you have to realize you need to create a type parameter P because you will be using shipments with various um, part identifier types. So we make it a type parameter and we just reference the part using that P type parameter. It's important that this type parameter be covariant because we will be generating uh, super types of identifiers as we insert into our collections. And this allows, them, allows us to kind of upcast all the previous values into the, the new type. We also want that property on shipments. So that list of shipment at the bottom, um, if we insert into parts, then we want to be able to reuse the old list of shipments and add a new shipment, possibly referencing the new part. But we want upcasting to work here. We don't have to do anything special because of that plus here. Of course, we can have multiple tables. Like we have an example with only two. Here's an example with three. Um, we've got three collections. The first references the second, and the second references the third. So here it's um, customers that have addresses, and uh, their address reference, uh, references a country. These are all um, uh, using the same pattern. So again, we pass a type parameter to customer that's going to be the address ID. To the address, we pass a country ID. And here we have two total maps to receive those in incoming references. And we have customers that uh, reference the addresses. So they, they use the uh, addresses.id. And the addresses reference the, the countries. So they use the countries.id. So this scales to multiple collections. Uh, you could wonder whether it um, addresses all types of foreign keys that you could, all this, the richness of foreign keys you can put in place in a uh, relational database. Um, like this, it doesn't. Uh, one problem is uh, cyclical constraints. As soon as you've got a cycle, then um, you get into a situation here um, where this user's collection is a total map, but it wants to reference itself. It wants to reference it, its own IDs. So that doesn't work. Um, but there's a way to 
go around that and it's just to uh, kind of split the process in two. First you create essentially one table or one collection to define your entities, uh, the users. Here we have a set of users. And we just pass unit here, so we're not storing any data about the users. So it's just which users exist. And then later on, uh, we create another total map um, where we store the data and we get to reference the identifier type here. So it's kind of a corner case. I uh, just wanted to illustrate it as a, for completeness. Uh, and this is using user set dot map, which is really just a total map that has the same ID type as, as this one. So here we got two total, total maps that share the same ID type. And working on this, breaking the cycles got me into um, adding this feature to the library, which is, it's a bit more experimental um, and there, I think I'd like uh, some features in Scala like um, type level functions that are, aren't quite there. So forced to emulate that by storing the complement here. Um, so this is a, essentially I want to talk about all the identifiers that are not currently in the total, total map. Uh, and the reason I want this is I want to be able to allocate elements in one map get this ID, and then insert it in two maps that I know share the same identifier types. And this wasn't possible with the previous insert function um, because it was doing both the allocation and the insertion at the same time. Here I want to expose a bit more, give more control to the user, um, and I need this intermediate type here. Um, so I'm storing that in the total map. This is a bit work in progress, um, mostly useful for situations where you have uh, cycles and you want to break them. So we talked about um, the identifier types a lot in the abstract. We have oh, this new identifier type, which is a super type of the previous one, but what are they really? like? We need to be able to give concrete types for these, at least when we want to build the library. This is where we're starting to look inside. Um, so if we think, um, let's think about our, an empty total map. So let's say um, we have a total map that's empty. The, the key type will have to be um, a type that does not admit any value. So can, can anyone think of a type that has no values in Scala that we could use? So nothing, yes. So it's not unit. Unit has one value, but nothing has no values. So that's, that's a good choice. So we'll use nothing to represent an empty set of values. And that's going to be the identifier type for our empty total maps. Now, when we insert one element into the total map, now we need a new identifier type that has just one value in it. What can we use? We could use unit. If we go in that direction, what would we use for two elements? Two Sorry? Two units. <laughs> two units? Mm, that would be, there's still just one value possible for two units. Booleans. Booleans, yeah, there would be two values. But then we get to three and uh, so we, we haven't found a general way of going from one level to, to the next. Um, so one way of generalizing this process is to find a type that has one more value than the previous type. Can anyone think of a type that behaves like that? You probably use it all the time. It's option. So an option of nothing has the value none in it. 
So it's that one additional value. Plus it's got all the previous ones wrapped in sum. So now we have one value in our set, one value in our type. This is good. And the nice thing about using option of nothing is we got a nothing here that we can again substitute using the same process. So we can continue this and have an option of an option of nothing that has two values in it. And this goes on. So on the left, because option is covariant, we are creating really a family of types that are super types of each other. So we start with the most restrictive type and then the other types are always super types. And on the right hand side you see what their values are and it's clear that they are supersets as you go down. So this is the property we, we wanted. Um, it's nice um, and it allows us to remove to some degree but it doesn't quite cover all the cases. If we remove the last element we inserted, we can clearly move back to the previous type, the previous row. But if we want to remove any other element, then we're in trouble. There is no type in that family uh, to represent, um, let's say, just the, the elements we introduced at row two and three, but not the one we introduced first. So we need to have a different approach. And the key here is, instead of using option, we will use either unit. Um, so if either option is like the, the plus one, either is like the plus, and unit is like the one. So we're just doing the same thing in two steps. So again, either unit adds one value, and that value is the left of unit. So we see the same process repeating, but now the difference is we have all these units that we could flip for nothings if we ever want to disable a value. And this is what we'll do here. If we wanted to remove the first element we inserted, we replace this first unit by a nothing in the type. And now we get to a subtype that excludes the first value. So we're starting to see how we can have a rich family of types with all the subtyping relationships we need for insertion and removal in arbitrary places in maps. Um, we still have a problem though is that if, if you think about the identifier for the 20th element we insert, it's going to be right of right of right of right 20 times and it's going to end with left of unit. Um, so that's very long and it obviously doesn't scale. So we want a better, better solution for that. One way of doing this is to change from this unary representation to a binary one. So we want, we kind of have a list on the left. We want a tree. How can we get to a binary tree? Well, instead of using an either, that has two alternatives, one of which we kind of use for unit or nothing. We'll have three alternatives, and one will be used for unit or nothing, but two will be left to create sub-branches in the tree. Here we are naming this type um, ID2, because just to remind you that it creates a, a binary tree. And we've named the constructor element here uh, instead of uh, possibly like middle of unit, but it's called element. So when we do this, uh, we have two nothings that we can replace and we can add two elements here. The last two elements that we added are at the same depth in the tree. So this scales a lot better. Uh, the length is now the logarithm of uh, the, the index of the element you've been, you're inserting. Now let's try to create a little picture. Um, here this would be an identifier type. It gets a bit cumbersome to look at this as, as a line of code. Um, if we display it as a tree like this, uh, this would be uh, an identifier type with three values in it. Uh, and 
you see this because there are three units here. Uh, there's a nothing occurring in the place where a unit could have been. So this element is uh, excluded. And all the other nothings that are, in, that are not in boxes are kind of places where we could extend the tree if we want to insert later on. Now, what's um, an ID here? An identifier is actually a path from the root of the tree down to a specific unit. So there are only three values in this type here. There's one more optimization that's uh, been put in place in the library. And this is just to number the positions in the tree. Um, storing these se sequences of constructors for left and right, and left and right, finishing by element, is kind of inefficient because each of these are, each of these steps are really bits. Uh, so we can encode the whole thing in one integer. So this is what we do. This means the values that are stored are really compact. And the complexity of the type you don't see anyway. It's, um, it's kind of emergent from the recursive definition of total maps. So this gets us to a pretty good level of efficiency. And these numbers, if you want to see them in the tree, they would, zero would be the root, uh, the unit in the root, actually, and then one and two. Uh, this element over there is four. Um, you might expect it to be five, but the numbering scheme is uh, recursive. Uh, you've got zero at the top. You've got odd elements on the left and even elements on the right. So there's a formula to go from. In the left branch, you just um, uh, so to look up an index, you check if it's zero. Uh, if it's if it's not and it's even, then you subtract one, divide by two, and go to that branch and recurse, and something similar for the right hand side. So the the, the numbers are not actually like left to right, depth first, but almost. They're, they're still depth first, but with some shuffling there. And if we look at a total map, it's going to be very similar to its type, its identifier type. It's, it will be a tree, a binary tree. And instead of unit, we will have the values, the, the payload will be there. So if we have a total map of strings, we would have strings in, this, in those three places in a total map. So if we want to index at element four, then we know where to go from that four using the rules. It brings us to a value. And we have a guarantee that there will always be a value there. Because the map. Uh, defines its own identifier type in a way that matches the structure of the map and the guarantee is always uh, enforced. So what's the performance of this? Uh, well, since this is a binary tree, uh, we get log n uh, lookups. Uh, actually, most operations will be log n, so it's pretty good. I haven't worked on um, getting the, the last bit of performance out of this, so I haven't tuned much. Um, so I would use this in si situations where, it's, um, where performance is critical. But roughly, it's on the same order of uh, performance as a map. Something that's different, though, is that uh, no rebalancing of the map ever occurs. So it could become unbalanced in some situation. As you insert, um, when you insert the next uh, element is used, so um, it will go like depth first, so the um, so breadth first, sorry, so the, the depth will not be uh, too high. But if you remove elements, the earlier elements, then you'll have some kind of wasted space at the top of your map, which might degrade performance a little bit. But this 
uh, benefit, um, the benefit of having no rebalancing is that you always know where an element goes. Uh, if you look for element 28, you know exactly when to go right and left to, to reach that element. So it is O of log n, but n must be understood as not the number of elements currently in the map, but the total number of elements that were ever inserted in that map. So it's slightly different. I've compared it uh, to a map. It's a bit hard to compare it, especially with that insert operation that um, takes care of allocation at the same time. Uh, I've created this insert all method that just folds and inserts repeatedly. And I compare it to a map, uh, creating a map from collection of tuples using the little breakout trick, which gives you a more direct creation of the map. Um, so the to total map is slower um, and appears to be getting slower as we move from 100,000 to a million elements but it's still within a reasonable factor and could probably be, be optimized. That's all I have for benchmarks, unfortunately. Um, I guess I'll add more uh, in the futures, uh, we'll remove operations and stuff like that. So to recap, the, the benefits of using total maps are that we get safe lookups. We also get safer updates. Um, and to some degree, the inserts and removals are also safer, uh, be especially with the complement type I showed, because now we can see that we can insert in a map only at locations where there is no element currently. So it's very easy in a map to insert and think that the element was not there and oh, you just ended up removing the previous element by mistake. So you, you can also avoid errors on insertion uh, removal, if you try to remove something and it wasn't there, then it's probably an error. Um, you might want to catch this at compile time if you can. Another benefit is that we have very descriptive identifier types, parts that ID I don't think could be clearer. Uh, it, it precisely describes what's happening. Uh, the limitations, we already um, touched on them. Um, but not all of them actually. So this traversal and removal is a kind of a pain, but it's, it's the cost of, uh, of this guarantee. You need to make sure, you need to prove that you have no um, old IDs lying around that uh, would, could be invalid. So as you go through your collections, uh, let's say you stored your identifiers in lists of sets and then you go through that list and go through that set to find those old identifiers and potentially remove them. You'll be generating new sets and new lists, so that generates garbage. Um, even in branches that didn't turn out to contain any invalid IDs. So that's another problem that could potentially be solved, but I'm not sure how exactly right now. So we'll have to count this in the drawbacks of the approach right now. And Another drawback, in a sense, which could be a benefit if you're just trying to learn Scala and path-dependent types. Um, the drawback is that you have to use the path-dependent types, and they are slightly tricky. The type inference works pretty well in Scala, but with um, path-dependent types, choices were made, um, I guess, in favor of the more typical use case where you don't have, you don't use path-dependent types. Um, so if you have a val A uh, of type int, and then you create this val B, and you say equals A, you have two vals, and what, what will be the type inferred for the second val? It will be int, because the first one had type int. Well, there is a more narrow type that would describe the situation better. It's like A dot type, so that the type of B, well, we know it's exactly the same value as A. By default, Scala will not, um, actually Scala will not infer that. You'll have to explicitly give a type to your B if you want to say that, oh, I know that B is exactly, exactly the same value as A. So um, as you work with total maps, you notice situations in which you need to do that. You need to give explicit types. It's not that bad, but uh, it's a change and it, it can be surprising.
So um, that was basically it. Um, I will skip over, uh, just basically, just mention this very quickly. Um, one of the reasons I was brought to um, this line of work was that I had a big application that was not using a database in a traditional sense. We were creating large collection, uh, large structures of maps that were referencing each other. <coughs> so that's a pretty, it's a valid, um, valid database. It's in memory. We just need to persist it. Um, this worked out pretty well, but um, it brought me to um, wonder whether we could support referential integrity in, in that kind of database. So it's not a typical s scenario, so that probably means that um, these data structures, you will not be able to uh, apply them um, in your everyday work because you typically will be talking to a database. But this uh, other type of database uh, in memory being persisted is perhaps a bit more in line with functional programming. And it, it might be a direction we want to go on in the future if we want fu functional programming to permeate all the sectors of our uh, applications. And in this sense, in this uh, scenario, I think total maps are especially useful. So the library is available on GitHub, uh, bold radius slash uh, total map. And there's a reference to a paper presented at the Scala Symposium 2015 called Referential Integrity with Scala Types. You can get that uh, paper from the GitHub. There's a link there that brings you to the conference page, and you can get it from there. That's it.